great to start with a big smile so a very good morning to all present in the auditorium and those who joined virtually i on behalf of uh, director niab and niab family welcome you all to today's event to celebrate the annual world one health day a global campaign that celebrates and brings attention to the need for a one health approach to address shared health threats at the human animal environment interface the one health day was initiated in 2016 by the one health commission the one health platform and the one health initiative team since then the international one health day is officially celebrated around the world every year on this day as you all know one health is an approach that recognizes that that the health of people is it closely connected to the health of animals and our shared environment its purpose is to encourage collaboration in research and sharing of knowledge at multiple level across various disciplines like human health animal health plant soil environmental and ecosystem health in ways that improve protect and defend the health of all species on this planet one health day provides us an opportunity for experts and the community to join together in one health education and awareness working together allows us to have the biggest impact on improving health for people animals plants and environment to achieve better health outcomes for all so now i invite our director madam dr taru sharma to come on dais and deliver her esteemed message and welcome today's distinguished guest professor vijay raju thank you professor very warm uh, welcome to professor vijay raju to the campus and iab good morning to everybody uh, present in this hall and others who are there through the youtube link uh i on behalf of all niabians uh, professor vijay raju and uh stand here to put a warm welcome so we understand uh, we have all have been trying this institute scientifically uh the kind of support you gave be it uh, our genomics project be it our one health or be it our vtf facility and your very thought that vtf should not stick only with the corona vaccine testing it should go ahead with the veterinary vaccine testing this historical decision which you took while as psa we all owe you a lot and i will not say much but uh, with few words the warmth of niab to you and dear students i like to tell you the block where you stay the word vijay itself you stay in that vijay block and uh, it was inaugurated by none other than uh professor vijay raghavan when dr subir was uh, director of this institute of course it was online but warmth was that same thank you for that as well with that i uh, request dr bapaditya of course uh, sir does not need any introduction however i just like you to introduce him so we uh, go ahead and hear him so as madam said words will be too few to describe the stature and the achievements of professor krishna swami vijay raghavan as a scientist thinker policy maker and what not professor vijay raghavan is an emeritus professor and former director of the national center for biological sciences he began his illustrious scientific journey following his graduation with a btech degree in 1975 and a masters in 1977 in chemical engineering from iit kanpur He completed his doctoral research from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in 1983 in the field of molecular biology, and thereafter his postdoctoral studies from the California Institute of Technology, USA. He has received numerous awards and accolades nationally and internationally. To name a few, he received the Santi Sharu Bhatnagar Prize in 1998. He is a fellow of all the science academies in India, the World Academy of Sciences. He is an elected fellow of the royal society and as a foreign associate of the us national academy of sciences he was a recipient of the infosys prize 
in the life sciences in 2009. He was conferred the Padma Sri in 2013. He also served as the Secretary of Department of Biotechnology Government of India. His research interests are in the fields of developmental biology, genetics, and neurogenetics, and on the important principles and mechanisms that control the nervous system, muscles during development, and how these neuromuscular systems direct specific locomotor behavior. And you all possibly know that a new species of gecko was named after him, Hemidactylus Vijay Raghavani in 2018. NIB family is truly elated for your presence, sir. And today, to grace this event, I welcome Professor Vijay Raghavan to the podium to share his thoughts. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Day, and uh, it's still a pleasure and honor to be here. I uh, thank uh, Dr. Taru Sharma and colleagues for inviting me. And it's a particular pleasure to see Dr. Radhana, Dr. Subir Mazumdar, Dr. Rawat, uh, and everyone. And it's wonderful to see this campus. Uh, I must admit that I've been here before this campus was developed, and uh, I've been to a previous temporary uh, for, uh, place. And it's absolutely fantastic to see and you know look at some, some of your facilities before coming here. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Day. It's uh, embarrassing on two counts. First of all, it's too long. Secondly, you mentioned dates, so it dates me. But the good news is that uh, like a good uh, Indian boy, I gave all my certificates and awards to my mother for safekeeping and she lost everything in the Chennai floods. So there's absolutely no evidence of anything <laughs> at all. So I could be another fake person here. So there's no record of anything I've done or not done. Uh, so it's, it's really wonderful to be here. And let me start by, you know, first of all, uh, pointing out, and if I have time, I'll you know, show some slides about that. I mean, we are in an extraordinary situation in the country and indeed in the planet today. Um, because of a variety of reasons. Um, I mean, in terms of the world itself, our situation is precarious because of the consequences of climate change, loss of biodiversity, environmental damage, the energy uh, crisis due to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, tensions of various kinds globally. So this is a you know unusual time. And the question is, what do we do about such a time? So I will address some of that uh, relatively speedily, I hope. And then, um, I don't know, I think the custom usually is in a foundation day lecture, you don't have questions, but I don't mind if you uh, want to ask questions. So that'll be lovely. Okay, so, uh, oops. Yeah, it is going back. But why did it start at the end? So you can see all my slides now. Ah. And which one? Ah, okay. Um, oh.
So what I talk about is shaping our scientific goals and how uh, our planet, which faces a crisis, uh, and how science can be an important have an important role in uh, resolving this crisis. Now, if you look at this uh, photograph, it's a beautiful photograph taken by the person who runs the Hanley radio telescope, uh, sorry, uh, optical telescope. His name is uh, George Angcho. And the telescope itself is operated from near Bangalore. And it's one of the most uh, really important successes of Indian science to have this telescope there and have it operated. The skies are beautiful. And this is a time-lapse photograph of the uh, Milky Way in the dark. And it's absolutely stunning. And this is the way, you know, our skies should be, uh, not the way they are in Delhi today. But uh, so this is in contrast to what we have done uh, to the you know, skies elsewhere today. So we can ask a simple question today. What will the world look like, let's say, in 2050? What will spaceship uh, Earth look like? And when you ask this question, we get actually from many people a rather deep vision of the future as it holds for us. And you've, I have mentioned some of the challenges. People are constantly saying that there's a disaster looming, you know, climate change, biodiversity loss, wars, migrations, and so on and so forth is going to make the next few years very difficult, which is for people. Uh, of my age, not of such a big deal, but people of your age here, substantially in the audience, it's a matter of great concern. This is the world you're going to be living, uh, be living in. Is it really going to be that bad? If so, what can we do about it? And if it's not going to be that bad, then why worry about it? Now, a lot depends on who you ask about what the future is going to be like. If you ask people um, which are these, you know, top uh, consultancy companies, they will give you a very different view than what environmentalists, climate change people and others will give you. So you ask them, they'll tell you that the world has got, you know, five key messages in 2020, uh, 2050, the state of the economy, the shifts in economic power, what are the drivers of global growth, what are the policy implications and what are the business implications. These are looking entirely from a business perspective. And to them, uh, everything is fine. Uh, the world has always managed to deal with the crisis by producing more, by uh, creating more jobs, by creating more industry, by packing people into mega cities. What's the big deal? But if you look at a different kind of report from the perspective of, let's say, biologists or scientists or climate researchers, you get a very different picture. And where is the truth? Is it somewhere, you know, uh, at the beginning or, you know, somewhere at one end of the spectrum or the other end and so on? That's what we need to ask. So uh, there are four aspects I'll talk about today, very briefly, each aspect. One is about us as humans. Uh, what is our role in the planet? Where did we come about and what is our state right now? What is our impact on climate, on biodiversity, and the environment? And then how do we go from it? Now, if you look at our role on the planet, uh, the planet came about something like 4.5 billion years ago. The universe about 13.5 billion years ago. And about 3.5 billion years ago uh, to 3.8 billion years ago, simple forms of life we're seeing. These are prokaryotes typically. And then three billion years ago, we had photosynthesis. So if you look, for example, at the origin of the universe and take, let's say, 14 steps from here, and each step is a billion years, then 14 steps away is when the universe started. And then 3.5 steps from here is when 4.5 steps from here Four and a half steps from here is when the Earth started, and three and a half steps from here is when life started. So there's a long period between the start of the universe and the start, the origin of our planetary system, and of Earth, and then of life itself. 
So then things start moving at a rapid pace. Two billion years ago, the speed step in here, we had photosynthesis started. And two billion years ago, we had complex cells, eukaryotes coming up, and multicellular life about a billion years. So this one step away from me is multicellular life. And we haven't even started looking at more complex forms of life such as ourselves. Now, 600 million years ago, we had simple animals coming. And then about 570 million years ago, arthropods, ancestors of our insects, arachnids, and crustaceans. 550 million years ago, we had complex animals coming. Uh, and then the fish and proto amphibians, and this is of course preceded by the massive Cambrian uh, explosion of life forms, which are illustrated here. And then 475 million years ago, you had land plants and you had uh, million years uh, of uh, sorry, flowers and seeds, insects and seeds coming together, uh, you know, uh, much later, about only 400 million uh, uh, years ago, just a fraction of a step away from it. Then you had amphibians, reptiles, mammals, uh, then you have birds, and then flowers. So this all is about 130 million years ago, we had flowers coming about, just, you know, a step, uh, a tenth of a step away from me. Now, 65 million years ago, something interesting happened. I mean, before that, of course, as I told you, there were mammals, plants, reptiles, flowers, and so on and so forth. 65 million years ago, this is something which can happen again, anytime, an asteroid crashed on us in Mexico. That completely changed the atmosphere of the planet and caused the extinction of very large forms of life. So, you know, the non-avian dinosaurs died out immediately and that resulted in the expansion because of this opportunity of the mammalian radiation. And it's only 2.5 million years ago, I'm barely moving from where I'm standing, that the appearance of Homo took place and only 200,000 years ago, modern humans came about, hominins came about, and we were living along with our relatives, the Neanderthals and Denisovans, not so long ago, the Neanderthals uh, were extinct probably around 25,000 years ago, very, very recent. So it's a dramatic change from 14.5 billion years to now. Accident upon accident has resulted in these, as Darwin said over there, endless forms most beautiful. And this variation we have seen in life forms and life itself has come about through natural selection in a manner which is favored by the ability to succeed just about managing an environment and entirely by chance. And we know from the work of Darwin and Wallace that all of these life forms are connected to each other. And we know much later from the work of you know molecular biologists, biochemists, and so on, that all life on Earth has a shared chemistry, and that shared chemistry is connected by the thread of DNA. So this resulted, of course, in the evolution of humans. But there are some features of ours which made us very distinct from other animals. One is the large number of neurons in our brain, and I, if we have time, we can discuss that. The second is our ability to oppose thumb and forefinger. So I can then throw a chalk at someone who's sleeping, which most other animals can't do. Uh, then the third is speech, and these resulted in the development of our software, language, the development of tools and machines of various kinds. And this has been the saga of change which humans have brought about. And this has resulted in cultural evolution going much, much faster than biological evolution. And through cultural evolution, we have changed the world. And as the neurophilosopher Dan Derek said, we have moved from being products of evolution by natural selection to those who wield the paintbrush on the canvas of the earth. We really have become stewards of the earth and we, we hold the future of the planet in our hands. So it's not just our survival as organisms anymore which is happening. We actually control the future of the planet. Now, this epoch, 
this Anthropocene, as many have called it, has many different origins, uh, start timelines, which people have given. One view is that the domestication of plants uh, and animals is the start of the Anthropocene, and you can see that footprint even now. Uh, for example, if you look at the uh, you know, uh, bones which are buried in earth, the largest number of bones you'll see are that of chicken, you know. Um, so humans have had a great impact on the earth by eating chicken on large volume. Um, all over you know, civilization and before. So about 10,000 years ago, the domestication of plants and animals started. And that, in some people's minds, is the start of the Anthropocene. But as domestication of plants started, people started running out of fertilizer. Natural fertilizers, manure, and so on were not enough to sustain a potential growth in population. So there was a very small population, and the burning of jungles to cultivate was not a form which sustained um, the growth of population, particularly as other aspects of human civilization grew language, learning, and so on, and machinery. And therefore, there was a need to get more food for livestock and for themselves. So as fertilizer started running out, people, particularly in European countries, went to China and South America and looked at large caves by the sea, which had bird droppings in large amounts, which, from which they got, got nitrate fertilizer and used that to grow crops in Europe. So that guano pushed fertilizer availability uh, for agricultural growth in Europe. Later on, when that ran out, they went to nitrite mines again in China and South America and got fertilizer from there. And as that started running out, there was going to be a huge calamity. People didn't have, you know, couldn't produce food enough. But two Germans, Heber and Bosch, invented the Heber Bosch process. And this is very nicely summarized in this book, The Alchemy of Air by Thomas Heger. And how this process completely transformed agriculture is an amazing story. Through the Haber-Bosch process, you could get, you could make ammonia, you could snatch nitrogen from the atmosphere and make ammonia, and that ammonia allowed you to make fertilizer, and that fertilizer allowed you to have agriculture and the food products in unlimited quantity. And that completely changed the way we grew our livestock and ourselves and populated the plant. And of course, it was bad corollary of this, it also fueled chemical weapons and the rise of Nazism. This is a wonderful book to read. Another example, so this is one point. Half the nitrogen in our bodies, by the way, today comes from the Heber Bosch process. So through fertilizer. So that's an amazing thing. Now, another view about the start of the Anthropocene is this cloud, which you see, in 1945, the mushroom cloud in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And this was the first step of a nuclear bomb, an atomic bomb. And that has left its footprint all over the world. And this is, again, another point which people say is the start of the Antarctica. And this, of course, is also a symbol of how dramatically the Earth has changed by here. So, to summarize, when you talk about humans, we have in this long walk from the start of the universe to us as humans today, literally an instant in that period of universal time is where we have come from. And through language and manufacturing and cultural evolution, we have completely changed the world in a manner which was unthinkable if there was anyone who could be thinking and watching all of this, it was unthinkable then, but it dramatically happened. So we have an enormous responsibility. So let's now go on to climate. As a result of our industrial activity, and this started with the first industrial revolution, and three things drove the industrial revolution, and they continue to drive subsequent industrial revolutions again and again and again. And the first was you know, in the start of the Industrial Revolution, the use of engines. And that came along incidentally with the understanding which came from thermodynamics. So this is an example of how theoretical physics 
and experiments were so tightly tied to each other. Thermodynamics and the invention of the engine were something which completely transformed industry. That engine, the power was one. The power, of course, needed fuel. So fuel and power was a major component of that whole system. The fuel came from coal and from fossil fuel. So that was a major component. So energy and its use was a critical aspect of all industrial revolution. The second is manufacturing. Changes in technology, such as the spinning jenny, which allowed mechanized making of cloth in a manner which disrupted traditional cloth making, was a major transformation. And that stays to this day. Not just the spinning jenny is a metaphor for how manufacturing capabilities can completely transform the means of production. And the third is people, the people who you hire the working class, the market, and so on. So these three components are, are there. And of course, as I mentioned, um, you know, the working class and the components are the sort of the end which we derive to make all of this. But a critical fourth component is communication. And that was the invention of the telegraph. With more code and communication, people could communicate everywhere. And that today is symbolized by the way we use the so these, in these three capabilities, our energy, our manufacturing, our communication, acted on people in a manner which changed the world again and again and again. And this has resulted in the world we have today, where we see all the consequences of massive industrialization of scale. It's completely transformed our lives. Uh, you know, lifespan has increased, the kind of food availability has increased. Diseases have not had the kind of impact they used to, uh, through education and the development of various kinds of tools. We have become extraordinarily cultured and able to understand so many things. Average IQ today, normalized for uh, economic uh, status and cultural context, is about several tens of points more than it was 100 years ago. So everything looks absolutely fantastic, and we moved from the planet of the apes to being the planet of the ass. So what, what more could one ask for? But we changed life dramatically. If you look at temperatures predicted, we go on to one prediction to 2050. Yellow means things are getting warm. Red means they're getting hot. Blue means it's nice and cool. The blue zones, even, even in the Arctic and Antarctic, are gone. There's yellow everywhere and there's global temperatures rising. Right? This is going to have enormous impact on the planet in multiple ways. I mentioned some, but particularly you're going to see major migration from Africa, Asia, South America, uh, into more downward regions in the southern hemisphere and upward regions in the northern hemisphere. This is going to completely transform society and politics in a way in the next few decades in a way which are unthinkable unless, you know, there are you know, something miraculous which happens in terms of uh, reversing global warming. If you look at greenhouse gas estimates in 2050, uh, you can see, you know, how CO2 equivalent uh, levels uh, at PPM is going to be. Uh, you have multiple possibilities. The green is the optimistic po uh, possibility if you manage to reverse greenhouse gas emissions uh, enormously. And there are other less optimistic uh, alternatives as we go along. If you look at sea level rise, that again is going to be amazing. Uh, again, there's optimistic, intermediate, and dangerous situation there. That's been measured very accurately now, more and more by you know satellite data. It's amazing how with satellite data you can measure very minuscule changes in sea levels anywhere in the world. There is the GRACE satellite, which uh, NASA launched from years ago, which is now in its second phase. These are two satellites which are separated by a fixed distance from each other with an error of just one hair's breadth. And as the satellites orbit the Earth, if one goes over a slight on a mountain or an increase or a decrease sea level, then this distance is altered and they have to correct. Then you can measure how much of that uh, increase or decrease in level has been done. So you can survey the entire world that data is publicly available. People in IIT Gauhati are looking at it in terms of the Brahmaputra level. 
or you can look at it from anywhere. It's absolutely amazing. So this data is there, it's democratized, it's available to anyone to see and, and to use and to see what's happened. If you take a flight from uh, anywhere in India to Bhutan, for example, you fly over Sagarmatha, Mount Everest, and you can see photographs uh, around now. This was the one I took for my plane in 2016. You can look at previous photographs and you can see the amazing uh, this is in November. If you can see the amazing um, fall in uh, ice cap mountains all over. So it's, it's, a, it's a visible effect. Now, all these not only affect you know, global warming and increased temperature and all sorts of consequences, but they can also have enormous effects in terms of potential pandemic and sudden changes in biology of animals and plants. Let me give you one example. In Kazakhstan, there is the antelope called the Saiga antelope, and that's shown over here. And this antelope is very hardy, but you know many of its progeny die each year because the conditions are also very, very different. One year, and this was in summer of I think 2017 or so, a very large number of these antelopes suddenly die. And an investigation was conducted into this, and uh, the results came out sometime in 2019. It turned out in the nasal passages of this antelope, there was a bacteria which was a commensal bacteria. And because of a very slight increase in temperature that summer, about 1.5 degrees or so, there was a change in the properties of the bacteria. And instead of just being a you know, commensal bacteria which didn't cause any particular problem. It invaded the blood vessels, caused sepsis, and you know, thousands of these antibodies are being done. So a change in ambient temperature can affect organisms which live symbiotically with other organisms, even if those mammals themselves, for example, are not affected by a small decrease in temperature. And these changes in properties can have an amazing effect. So these are some things we have to keep in mind. So climate is something which affects the whole range, and you're going to see that in terms of effects on pollination or insects, uh, on you know migrations of uh, disease-borne vectors and so on. Now let's go to biodiversity very quickly. Uh, you know there is going to be uh, the fall in farmland uh, in uh, green uh, areas available. The area for infrastructure and engineering is likely to increase. The food crop area is likely to increase. Pasture land is likely to decrease. Forestry land is likely to decrease, and so on. This is over, you know, this is particularly for the OECD breaks, the rest of the world and the world put together. These are four different charts. And you can see that the BRICS countries are changing rather dramatically. The plants which uh, are there which grow, which have been acclimatized for different latitudes, their properties will change. Uh, plants which grow well in the currently in the tropics will go to more and more northern areas. Plants which are in temperate regions will change their properties, like the example I gave you of the antelope, and we don't know how they will change, how they will adapt. Insect pollinators will also have to change their tack. And when people try to restore forests by replanting, they don't take care and they plant varieties which are not native or they plant varieties in excess amounts uh, in a manner not looking at the environment. It's not clear that this reforestation itself is going to be a particular value. Insect ranges can be seriously hurt by climate change. Uh, you know, their um, estimates that they lose half their range by 2100. Uh, the plant, the grafters, insects, plants, and vertebrates, how their range changes, uh, and the insect ranges will change a lot. And the insect abundance has been steadily falling uh, in the last uh, 20, 20 years. So let's now come to the environment. Uh, this is a, the Ghazipur dump near Delhi. Uh, this is 
in Haryana. This is in Kalahati. You can see exotic migratory cranes over there. Very nice. Livestock. This is One Health Day, so you can see all One Health represented here. And when you therefore look at spillover, and you see spillover, zoonotic spillover taking place, historically zoonotic spillover took place in regions where there was close proximity, such as forests or wet markets between humans and animals. Today, that spillover, oops, or do I go back? Can you go back? This is not uh, further back. Uh, yeah, one back, one further back. Yeah. So today's spillover uh, can take place in these kinds of locations. You don't have to go to a wet market in the northeast or to Wuhan um, to have spillover. So just right next door, I mean, this is a huge dump, but you walk outside there, there's no shortage of dump. You're going to see. I mean, I've seen in Andheri in Mumbai, uh, flying foxes coming down and feeding on garbage dumps. They're there with rats and dogs and cats and garbage right next to the fanciest building. And this is something which we happily tolerate uh, without any problem. And we think nothing will happen. It's a time bomb. So spillover can happen anywhere. But we seem to assume that somehow it will not. And usually what happens, you know, you get people who are in contact, will get something, get some disease, they have fever, which cannot be caused, cannot be attributed, and then recover. Because most of the bugs, the viruses, and bacteria, and parasites, they have been selected to for specific hosts. Occasionally, there will be cell spillover. And occasionally, there will be a spillover from which allows transmission from human to human. And even more occasionally, that will go to a rather large extent. And even more rarely, it will result in an epidemic. And even more rarely, it will result in a pandemic. But if you buy a lot of lottery tickets all the time, you will win. Right? So there's no doubt about it. And you're buying billions of lottery tickets. It's not that occasionally you buy one lottery ticket and you know, you, it's not a big deal if you go into a garbage dump one day, but if you're doing it every day, and the entire population is doing it every day, it's a problem. So, given this, uh, what do we do? Now, when you look at the future, there are two categories of what I call historians of the future. There are those like Paul Ehrlich over here, uh, and before that, Malthus, who predicted that. You know, as population grows, as the carrying capacity of the planet is limited, there'll be a real disaster, there'll be disease, death, destruction, and so on and so forth. So, Paul Ehrlich, the Club of Rome, the IPCC for climate, all of them have talked about major kinds of disaster. And Rosling, who died a few years ago, is much more optimistic. He argues that population trends are declining, Countries which were once poor are dealing with maternal and child that much better. Technology is recovering, uh, you know, lost spaces in multiple ways. And so things can actually change for the better. But the fundamental problem with the way we have grown is illustrated by Partha Dasgupta, who is in Cambridge, the professor in Cambridge. And Partha and several other economists, some of whom have got Nobel Prize, have pointed out. And the fundamental characteristic of the industrial revolution, which I mentioned, is that we get products cheap today of high quality, scalable in their manufacture, but we make future generations safer. Right? The environmental impact, the planetary impact, is paid for by the next generation. So, Arthur points out, the chainsaw is an amazing technological invention. Instead of slowly cutting a tree, you can sell a tree in an instant. Isn't that wonderful? You can make furniture right away. You can market it all over the world. You can sell for, uh, forests everywhere, right? And you can, you know, maybe put forests again. That's completely wrong, of course. And the reason why you do it in that manner 
is because future generations are paying for the destruction of the forest and you are not paying for it now. He also points out that the deep sea trawler, fishing trawler, is again another kind of amazing in that. You can catch fish the way which you never could catch before. And large scale agricultural farming was also the same kind. So the solution to this is not that you don't have these kinds of technology. We can't harker back in a nativist manner to some previous time. But the solution is that the cost for the future should be paid now and not for the future. That requires a major change in our economic outlook and the way we conduct business all over the world. And that's a strangle hold which is not easy to change. So in this situation, where should our science focus? And I'll go through that relatively quickly. I think that the only way we can get back from this is if there is a global attitude which we take in this crisis and no national approach will be sufficient to deal with this planetary problem. Just like diseases, climate change is a global problem. So how does one deal with it? So let's look at the way we should behave as a community of science. It's not that we have to stop doing your algebraic geometry or your mathematics and focus on the garbage now, but both are important and the question is how can we do that? To be able to do that, we construct this kind of a quadrilateral uh, square with four squares inside. One, you have the knowns and the unknowns. And let's take the top left, the known knowns. And these are things which we are aware of and we understand. So when we know that, what do we do in those areas of research? These are areas I've talked about, climate, environment, biodiversity, health, energy, there's so much exciting things to do. And those are areas that you must hit right away in a collaborative manner. And how to collaborate is something I'll mention very briefly a little bit of that. So this is, these are the known known. Now you can come to the next point, which is the unknown knowns, bottom left. These are things we understand, but we're not aware of. And this will be very helpful going forward. And these could be areas such as the deep ocean, outer space, the, the bugs in your backyard. So these are areas of extraordinary opportunities for research. And we should take those up. The third quadrilateral are the known unknowns. That's the top right hand side. And these are areas which are really very exciting. Uh, these are things which we are aware of, but we don't understand. We know that we have a brain, uh, at least you do. Uh, and we don't know how it works. Uh, and so that's a very exciting area. We know very little about the origin of life. That's another exciting area in physics and mathematics. There are major unsolved problems. The Clay Prize, for example, gives the award for the solving another sort of equation. So these are very exciting. And all of these will feed back on each other. It's not that, you know, that this will not help the other kinds of problems. So it's, it's very important that we, that we do everything together as individuals, but collectively address those big problems. And finally, at the bottom right, you have unknown unknowns, things which we're neither aware of, nor do we understand. Imagine that you lived in an isolated bubble and you didn't see the development of the bicycle or the motor car or the airplane or the wireless or the internet and so on and so forth. And you are completely isolated. So you wouldn't know of this, nor would you understand this, your language will not have this, your culture will not have this. And suddenly supposing some, you come across this, how will you deal? How can you deal with the unknown unknown? And those unknown unknowns, we don't know. And therefore we don't know how to deal with. And the only way we can actually address that issue is by having our campuses full of young students being curious and active about all the other things so that they interact and they're ready for any un, uh, I mean, uh, unknown situation and can rise to the occasion and match. So the streams of knowledge should come from everywhere and feed the wells you know, of our institutions, so that when there's something completely 
which we don't know will happen or cannot even imagine it now. So I can't even say what it will be like. We can go back in time and see some instances like I mentioned. Then you are actually prepared. So education is absolutely critical. In that education, India needs to connect to Bharat. All our top institutions are a short walk from India. Uh, we don't seem to care about what's outside, yet we talk about very important big things we need to do. So how can we manage that connection despite us having grown up in isolation? Growing up in isolation is not bad. Unless you have isolation, you cannot develop excellence. But unless you break that isolation, then excellence is no value also. So you have to also do And particularly, this connection has to involve women on large scale. We are doing better than we were, but we need to do hugely better, particularly in leadership positions. In every area of science and technology, women should be at the top. And this is something which we need to very consciously do. We seem to have no problem in choosing men and taking a gamble about their quality, but we have a similar problem in choosing women and taking a gamble about their quality. So we should have women in leadership positions much more. So in all of this, there are many things to do. Uh, we often think that big data, technology, our equipment, our institutions, all of that are very important. They are very important, they're necessary. But the one thing that is important more than the instrument, more than our institution, is what lies behind the eyepiece of a complex instrument. So you have, you know, six inches behind, you have a brain there. That's what we need to use to address all these problems. We can manage that, then we will run a great job. Thank you very much. There's another PowerPoint which will take me 30 seconds to show. Uh, there's another PowerPoint. Can you put that on? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at our national laboratory in India, that's India for you from Google Maps. These are the DST labs in the country, right? These are the DBT labs in the country. There's more than this number, some of them overlapping, but more than one city. These are the ICAR labs. These are the ICMR labs, DRDO. Now here are the central universities. All these national labs and some central universities get 90% of our research funds and 10% of our students go over here. 90% of our students go here. They get 10% of our research funds. These are our state universities. This is a disaster. Unless we change this by opening up our national labs, like the DRDO, ICAR, ICMR, DAE, to young students in a manner where it's bubbling with students, we are causing a global disaster. We have a large young population. If they are not exposed to science and technology on scale, and if we say, oh, but the state universities don't work, and therefore I have to make my top class national lab which is work working, very good, that's necessary. Make a top class national lab which works well, but connected to the state university. Other or to the central university next door. Otherwise, this is going to be an unmitigated disaster. We'll be talking about what we're doing again and again and what we need to do, but we're not getting on it. Today is One Health Day. Each of these organizations, ICMR, CSIR, DDT, Department of Health Research, Department of Animal Health, all of them are working on One Health, independent. All of them are working to address AMR, independent. There are coordination committees, but they are not coordinating. In fact, unless we change that mentality in each of the ways we function, we are not going to go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for participating in the video.
So this is a very important point. See, historically, there has been constant optimism in human nature. And, you know, so when you run out of copper, you're running out of copper, you say, I'll use fiber and, you know, Wi-Fi and so on and so forth. And when you run out of oil, you have some other source of energy and so on. So, but today's world is a bit different. It is not in that part of the growth curve where resources are still hugely available and you can clear up a mess by a technological change. You've reached a precipice of some sort and it's a non-linear part of the curve where you do not know whether if you reverse something, you go back the same way or you go back in some other way, right? In the linear part, when you're growing slowly, as you go up, you can come back. Now you've gone in some kind of a rise which is not predictable scientifically. So first of all, to answer your question, can we go back? In theory, that's a science. I mean, you have to answer that by good theory and good experiment. That's a scientific question. It's not one of opinion. When you have such dramatic changes and such dramatic rates of change and such dramatic rates of rates of change, what are the dynamics of that situation? It's a very difficult thing to calculate or predict about how you can go back. So that's that's a tough part. But that doesn't mean, um, you know, this famous author Amitav Ghosh said that we are in a runaway train. Uh, he talks about climate change a lot. Of course, if you're on a runaway train without the engine driver, then what's the point in doing anything? So I disagree with that metaphor that we are in a runaway train uh, because there are things which are happening which allows uh, allow us to reverse things. So there are two. One is adaptation and second is mitigation. Now you can mitigate the consequences of climate change by changing your energy source, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, by you know looking conserving biodiversity, dealing with the environment to whatever extent you can. But because of this momentum, you're not going to change this impact overnight or even in a short run. So you must therefore also pay a lot of attention to mitigation. So, are there going to be floods every year as opposed to every 20 years? In which case you have to change the nature of the society, the city in, in that manner. Are there going to be temperatures which reach a wet bulb temperature of 35 or 40, in which people will just keel over and die, birds will drop from the sky. How are you going to deal with that? So those adaptation technologies are again within our reach, but you must do that on scale. What's going to happen socially and politically? Are you going to see massive migration? If so, how are you going to deal with that? People have no problem 
with capital flowing across countries, but they have strangely a problem historically with people flowing across countries, right? So how are you going to deal with migrations due to this? How are you going to adapt to that? So adaptation is feasible, but that's something which has to be squarely addressed in a very, very complex way. What happens when large part of the Maldives goes underwater or large part of Bangladesh or you know Bengal starts getting affected? Uh, so these are all adaptation issues in addition to mitigation. So adaptation has to be local, mitigation has to be broader, both local and global. So that's something we must feel. But it's a very tough call. Thank you very much, sir, for really thought provoking and the way you have Right. I mean, the matters related to climate are in, intricately linked to One Health. And by One Health, I, of course, include not just humans and our livestock, but also plants. Uh, then, of course, how you know disease can happen. Remember, 10,000 years ago, humans and our livestock were 1%, 0.1%, of vertebrate biomass 10,000 years ago. Today, humans and our livestock constitute 98% of vertebrate biomass. So climate affects and floods and extreme weather conditions affect everyone and can have dramatic changes on zoonotic diseases. So it's, it has to be looked at integrated man. The problem is everyone agrees upon this and everyone will have a nice meeting where they all sit together and agree. But the very same capacity which allows us to analyze these problems by building institutions is a hindrance today in getting them to function together. As Subir pointed out, we'll function together if there's a disaster tomorrow. If there's a flood in Hyderabad, everyone will come together and do something. And if there's something has to be done about cleaning up after a disease or in a disease, everyone will come together. But before something happens, are we willing to do something? Those require policy changes, legislation, as well as action. So we must interact with that community. A very inexpensive motor car is one where you have only a handbrake, no seat belts, have only parking lights, remove the top, you know, put wood on the floor, no problem. 90% of the time will be fine. But, and it costs much less, right? Why prepare for a future where if there is an accident, I'll have a seat belt or an airbag, I'll drive carefully, right? But because of legislation, we have put all these things in place to take great care. So policy changes are very, very important. And we as scientists must engage with politicians relentlessly, local politicians, you know, state level, central, international, to bring about policy. It's a tough task. Politicians are elected by us, right? But because of this system, their goal would be to serve us and get re-elected. Industry looks at returns in every quarter. Scientists look at returns every decade. Who's going to look at these tra tragedies of the commons, which everyone needs to pay attention to? So that we really need to push from top down to good leadership politically and bottom up to you know, proper policy uh, formulation to get these changes done. It's feasible, it happens. It's happened, there are many examples of this happening historically. The worry I have is that in today's world, that those linear extrapolations of what happened previously may not apply as much, given the crisis situation in many ways. Yet, a combination, as I said, of mitigation and adaptation can address. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Can we have some questions on this morning? Yeah, please go ahead. Very nice talk, sir. Uh, obviously, we are coming uh, across the news that uh, life of this, uh, like they are uh, made that you can become one of the most the life of the country for the same country of that. Many countries are thinking of reducing the life of population. There is another reason for the reason is that uh, increase the LDS for, for the country. So they are so uh, in the country like India, where agriculture uh, is dependent on livestock, and also why health is so easy, and uh, manual is coming from the livestock. So what will be the like, what will be the policy for Indian in Indian context? Should we go with the normal like we should salvage the animals, we should retain it, or when we will go in the future, we can get ten years or so. You know, um there are two ways to look at this. This is a very important problem. There are two ways to look at it. Um, first, in theory, we must distinguish between the answer to a question and a solution to a problem. An answer to the question is easy. We should not have animals emitting methane, so either stop having livestock. We should have agriculture. Um, we should have agriculture more sustainable, less use of fertilizer, less use of pesticides, you know, sensible and so on. These are answers. Solutions are what you can implement. Solutions are complicated. Answers are not implementable. You can't overnight do any of those things. Solutions require, you know, dealing with sociology, farmers, livelihood, economics, you know, markets and so on. Now for that, the question is, what is your unit of looking at? Is India the unit? Is each agroclimatic zone in India the unit? Is a state the unit? Because the solutions will apply differentially in different contexts. So we should look at those kinds of solutions and see what is happening. And it's possible if you choose the unit in a tractable manner, you can get feasible solutions in that context. How much livestock in a particular state or in a particular agroclimatic zone is used, what is the way you can mitigate their impact? How will you do this? You know, how will you look at your diet pattern so that you have nutrition as well as, you know, sustainable development? So those are hard things which has to. So there's no easy answer to that. But you have to define the. Unit. Yeah, that I would. Yeah, they're very required, but there I think you know, um, again you have to find out certain kinds of solutions. See the farm laws were interesting um, and the way they were pushed back uh, so leave that aside from the position of farmers income and growth and so on how they could be valuable and there's a lot of discussion on that but similarly the question of how one looks at sustainable farming in a situation remember much of our far farming in india as distinct from farming elsewhere in the world which has other kinds of problems our farming came about in a situation on this scale when scientists were told you have unlimited water, unlimited pesticides, unlimited fertilizer, give us high yielding varieties. So that is the culture under which a lot of farming has grown on scale. Elsewhere in the world, large farms, monocropping on huge scale has grown. So these have resulted in huge economic value to a variety of communities. I would not call them vested interests. These are interests and they feed the entire world. Now, how does one change this? That's the solution. You cannot override say, you know, cut this, cut that, do this, do that. You're looking at people's livelihood and both at both ends, those who produce and those who buy. So that again requires the definition of the unit, changing opportunities so that people can move from using horse-drawn carriages to motor cars as it were in different kinds of ways. Sustainable agriculture is a very exciting area. There are many tools which allow it to happen. So, as I said, there are two components. Uh, 
mitigation and adaptation. So, uh, mitigation is something which needs to happen both at a local and a global scale. And a very important component of mitigation is policy change. Next week in Sharm El Sheikh will be the next COP meeting. And they take global views on what target should be met or not. And typically, those are compromise targets which look at reality and what can be achieved. So at an individual level, whether you're a mathematician or a physicist or a chemist or a biologist, get involved in groups, get yourself aware of details of these kinds of things so that you can give your views. It's, I think, completely wrong to have a strong view as a scientist without being also part of a solution. So whatever your view is, is across the spectrum, you should be able to contribute you know, to being part of the solution. If you're a statistician or a mathematician, you can contribute in one way. If you're doing livestock research in another way, but contribute to policy at that adaptation level, uh, mitigation level. In terms of adaptation, there are lots of things to be done. You know, at a small level, at an individual, as a scientist here, you might say, I want to look at livestock, which is more resistant to disease. I want to have vaccination for more for potential diseases or livestock which are more hardy. I want to build sheds which are air conditioned for livestock using you know solar power. So lots of things one can do. But really, what we should do is not worry too much about what a given individual does, but there should be an emergent property of an institution or a cluster of institutions you know, either locally or in connected in a manner, which addresses all these problems. So <clears throat> just as, you know, people gather together very easily for a party, and there's no necessity for organizing a party or a celebration on some days, similarly, people should gather together to address these kinds of complex problems. And if you look at Hyderabad, you know, enormous uh, opportunity. There are about close to 40 national laboratories in Hyderabad most of whom don't know about the existence of the others. They can't name more than two or three more. And they cover every kind of capability from pharma, vaccines, defense, you know, earth sciences, everything, nutrition and so on. So uh, just working together and getting a culture of working together will be good. Top down doing that is one component, but bottom up should be easy. Uh, one should do that. My question is, do you think nature has its own way to control the population? Like pandemics are not no meaning to us, like it happens every day, every country, every country. So, as we are evolving day by day, we, we most of the pandemics are because of the disease only, and now we are more evolved, we have done so many vaccines and antibiotics to control the disease. Now there is other way, because if the population go uncontrolled in manner, the nature has some way to control that population. It might be because of the global warming or it might be because of something else. So do you think just the uh, anthropogenic reaction is going to be responsible for all these uh, activities? So that I can give an example, like in Delhi, in around 1998, 1999, the pollution was extreme because of the buses, diesel buses. Then it was replaced with PNG buses. The pollution came down. But now, again, in the last uh, seven, eight years, because of this trouble burning, they are living that. But I don't think that it's because of that. Because the environment is changing. So, similarly, the program will come in due to the, what we have developed. We call it technology. But ultimately, some challenge will come after even we have developed something for, uh, to tackle a uh, problem. Again, the, same, uh, the more advanced program will come. So let me summarize your point. You are saying that no matter what you do, things will get worse. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. So if things are inevitably going to get worse, what can you do? Now, I don't think things are necessarily inevitably going to get worse. There are lots of examples historically. In recent history, where things haven't gotten worse. If you look at the uh, Rhine or the Danube or the Thames, they were just garbage pits about 100 years ago. If you look at Buffalo, New York, it was an industrial wasteland. Pittsburgh was an industrial wasteland. I mean, they're completely different now. It's not just economic growth, but it was a community 
change in mindset that look this is not on china was one of the world's greatest polluter and now it is one of the world's greatest environmentally conscious movements it has so things can change even on large scale so i don't see that as intrinsically as a problem uh but the question is um we also are something about population population growth is actually declining in most places uh it's plateau and hans rosling you should read up his books he's pointed out countries such as bangladesh countries in africa india um you know the gulf all of them according to him are plateauing and coming down europe has got a serious problem in uh, population growth has actually come down quite a bit japan has got a very aging population so his point is that population is not any more an issue the point which others make about population is a valid one is that you know how much of that is deals with the carrying capacity in a sustainable manner but that horses bolted from stables a long time back you're not going to address that issue you cannot say i have these much resources and i would love to have the world have you know a fifth of the population or a tenth of the population that's not that's one of these answers which doesn't have a solution so it's possible that you know as uh, one pays attention to the environment that uh, and uses mechanization in an interesting way in an intelligent way with different sources of energy that you're going to have population trends continue to decline without the requirement of large young populations to drive the economy many countries with lower population growth now want a population increase that may not be required all the time so these are you know dynamic changes which are not easy again depends on what is the unit we're looking at is it a country is it a continent is it a city